This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 448. Our brains aren't designed for change. They're not designed to make us happy. Our brains aren't designed for innovation. They're not designed for ebbing and flowing with the market. They're designed for protecting us. Would you like to amplify your influence, leverage a variety of behavioral motivators to achieve positive outcomes and results, and frame your ideas in a way that encourages engagement and gets an active response from your followers? And how to intentionally choose a communication style aligned with your influence objective? Well, stick around. Today's episode is about all that and more. Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast, the podcast that's dedicated to your personal and professional growth. I believe that if you want to achieve true success in your business and in your life, then intentional and consistent reading is an absolute must. That, of course, is the right first step. As we talk often, the next step is taking what you've learned and being able to put it into action. We'll talk about that a little bit more today in my interview with today's guest. And I want to remind you that that's also something my new course helps you with as well, putting your learning into action. It's called Note Making Mastery. And though I've offered it as a live cohort on three previous occasions, it is available right now in a self-paced version at jeffbrown.me. In Note Making Mastery, I teach you how to better collect and capture your notes, what to write, how much, what tools to use and when, how to better connect and organize your notes so that you can easily and effectively and sometimes serendipitously find them later when it matters. How to crystallize your notes. In other words, how to better develop and distill them so that your unique response to the inputs, your own ideas and insights generated from the content you consume, doesn't fall through the cracks. And how to better create from your notes. After all, what's the point of consuming all the content in the first place if you never share what you've learned with the world, whether that's online, at work, or even in conversation? And that's just the start. Simply put, if you want to improve retention and comprehension of the content you consume for learning and growth, if you want to be the go-to person for ideas and insights when everybody else is getting stuck, if you'd like to see the outputs that result from your content consumption efforts lead to new connections, well-deserved promotions, and opportunities that were previously out of reach, then your notes, your personal knowledge management system is the difference maker. It's the one thing, all else being equal, that will give you the edge, a crystal clear advantage. Again, I hope you'll check it out right now. It's available in a self-paced edition. You can get access to the entire course in an instant when you go to jeffbrown.me and select Note Making Mastery from the options that you'll find there. Again, it's jeffbrown.me. Rene Rodriguez is a dynamic keynote speaker, leadership advisor, change management consultant, and renowned speaker coach. For the last 25 years, he's researched and applied behavioral neuroscience to solve some of the toughest challenges in leadership, sales, and change. His company has trained over 100,000 leaders from companies including Coca-Cola, 3M, Wells Fargo, Nestle, Microsoft, and more. His new book is called Amplify Your Influence. Transform how you communicate and lead. Well, Renee, I am excited to to learn of you and your work, and and I find that I'm probably in the minority of those who who didn't know of you uh, before today. But I am certainly excited to have been introduced to everything you're doing, and certainly the new book. Welcome officially. Glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. And you're not in the majority. I've been doing this 28 years, and. Uh, I'm, I'm used to people not knowing, so it's all good. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We can do what we do for so long and 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 feel like uh, you know we're we're doing a, a great job, as I often feel like I'm doing with the show. And 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 you know, people, everybody certainly knows about it by now, but that is, that's never the case. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's it's good for us. It's good humbling. Yes, for sure. Well, uh, let's begin with this idea of how to uncover the brains, uh, and I'm going to quote you here: hidden drivers of behaviors. Uh, these behaviors that can help lead us to ultimately our desired results. Well, you know, it's fascinating when we think about even just the concept of the brain and the brain is what is the source of the drive, the motivation to do things. And a lot of times we think that, you know, and what we've thought has been the driver is really isn't. We think logic might be the driver, but there are so many hidden reasons why we do things that the more you shed light on those reasons, I mean, to me, the more you understand life, the more you understand yourself 
And what's crazy is a lot of those drivers aren't even conscious to us. And so, mm. you know, you look at the media knows a lot of those drivers, <laughs> politicians, and you know, the people behind that know those drivers, branding agencies, marketing agencies, know those drivers, good sales professionals and good leaders intuitively knows those, those drivers. And so when we understand them for ourselves, we're able to influence more. And when we understand how they're being used on us, we're able to make better decisions. Uh, Speaking of influence, I'd I'd be curious to know if and if so, how uh, the work of Robert Cialdini has impacted your view on a lot of this. He's obviously well known in that area. Mm -hmm. Anything there from him that has influenced you or impacted you over the years? Uh, Dr. Cialdini is is, uh, he's he's a legend, obviously, and his work has been more focused on the marketing and and side of things in terms of understanding sort of the the law the the what he calls his laws of influence and i'm 28 years in the application of it in terms of what what does all this mean so he obviously has some some influence in in the work of influence for me it's about you know what i've learned in neuroscience and behavioral neuroscience to be specific and then working with hundreds of thousands of people for almost 30 years now in what works and what doesn't and so i'm what's called an applied psychologist so i apply the learning and there's, but I, I work hand in hand with those who are the researchers, the ones that do the work that are much smarter than me, a lot smarter than me. But when we collaborate and, you know, I work with, with the co-founder of the Neuro Leadership Institute as well, Dr. Al Ringlip, who runs a business school in, in Italy called Chimba. And he's got 30 years of studying this stuff. And he goes, Renee, you got 30 years of applying it. We just need to put our heads together. Mm. And he actually wrote the forward of the book, which to me is one of my favorite parts of the book. Uh, Cialdini is legendary and it's to me though and that like any book and i think you'd appreciate this because just the base of this podcast i always ask people when you like a book or you listen to a speaker i go what can you do as a result of it can you do the book like mm-hmm. can you do it like is it is it rah rah did it feel good i mean there's certain <laughs> books that man they feel great or mm-hmm. man that was fascinating research but how do we apply it has always been my driver of everything yeah, from going from intention to implementation, right? Yeah, that's 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 important to me for sure. And I tell my listeners often that you know reading is really the first step. If you're reading books and consuming other content and not doing anything with it, what was the point of reading or consuming in the first place? With regard to to engagement, whatever uh, scenario that might be, what what can we do to prevent the defensive parts of our brain from playing the role of saboteur? <laughs> So when you think about the, the defensive parts of our brain, it, you're, I, and we know this, we've heard it so often. And when we were saying this 30 years ago, people are like, what? But <laughs> our brains aren't designed for change. They're not designed to make us happy. Our brains aren't designed for innovation. They're not designed for ebbing and flowing with the market. They're designed for protecting us and not changing typically. And that that process of not changing or homeostasis when it comes to sort of body regulations and things like that. And But homeostasis of our environment as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's designed to, in essence, work against us. And so you have, whenever we talk about influence, most often influence is this offensive strategy. What can I do? What technique can I use? How do I structure my language? Which is all necessary. It's all critical. Mm -hmm. But the approach I take begins first with how do you prepare the listener? And it's the idea of, would you plant a seed in cement? And of course you wouldn't, because the seed wouldn't grow. But most of listeners aren't ready to hear an idea. They're not ready to do that. And their brains are designed for it. And you know, you're going through a market change or a change in job or a change of any sort, that stress triggers the parts of our brain that shut down the creative parts. They shut down the parts that are open to new ideas. And if I'm selling a product or if I'm leading, most of my job as a manager, as a leader, as a salesperson, as a speaker, a teacher, a police officer is managing change. I've got to change behavior and that inherently will trigger resistance. And so my process needs to account for that before I begin to lay the message foundation out. And if I can do that, I can till the soil and, you know, tilling the soil is easy, but what if, if you got cement, truly cement, you got to pull the jackhammer out and you got to get rid of that cement and the ways in which we do that are probably not conventional to what people might think. When you talk about taking out the jackhammer to the cement, uh, it reminds me of a story you tell early in the book where you're about to give a talk and the person before you has basically had to deliver his or her talk with clanging silverware and plates. And, and it's kind of at the point where it's wrapping up where you take the stage, but you realize you got to do something. Can you share a bit about how you handled that moment and took control of, of the room to make sure you had people's attention? Yeah. And it's one of the first concepts is if you're, if you are delivering from front of the room, it's, you have to control the room. 
And I'm not saying controlling, but being controlling. These are the things that, you know, control the controllables. The environment matters. The ambiance matters. The position of the chairs matter. If you're in classroom style, it's different than table rounds or sitting in a circle. It's Mm -hmm. there's, there's spaces in between all of those things matter. And depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you should take into account the room. And what I tell people is that the lunch keynote is one of the hardest keynotes that you can give because you are competing with so many different pieces. And this was uh, 600 people in a room. And of course, if you get 600 people eating, imagine just the amplification of 600 forks hitting a plate, knives cutting through, glasses being putting down. And then you got 100 staff pouring you know, quickly that really don't care that you're speaking and they're not there to, to, you know, aid in your presentation. And then you've got people that are consuming food, which is a highly visceral engaging experience. And then you're trying to deliver a message, which is supposed to be engaging, Mm. but is it as engaging as the food or maybe the conversation that of course, eating and conversing kind of go hand in hand. So you got all of these factors that are playing into this. And so I had warned my client to say, Hey, you know, you need to be extra engaging, get off the stage, walk around, capture attention. He's like, no, 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 I got it. And he told a story about literally him almost dying as a result of COVID. And he's a great storyteller, magnificent leader, and no one was listening. Mm. So I went up and I went before I went up, I said, let me show you what I mean. And so I stood up and said, I just said, first, before we get started, I said, I, let's just give our staff here just a big round of applause for all the hard work they're doing. And everybody gave him a, a standing ovation. I said, like everybody stand. I said, now staff, if you are picking up plates, lunch is now over. If you would, while I do this next exercise, please collect all the plates and bring them outside. Thank you so much. All right. And so then I went, I said, I've got a challenge right now. It's the same challenge that all of you face is how am I going to capture your attention? In a highly distracted world. Here we've got plates clanking. We've got food being delivered. Some of you may not even finish your meal. And I told you, hey, we're done. So you might be competing with the fact that you're angry with me. Those are realities that we all have to face, that you have to face with your clients, everything. So we're going to talk about exactly what's going on right now. So I use the scenario of what was very real and relevant to talk about the lesson. Mm-hmm. And my, my team was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I knew that that moment was uncomfortable for about 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. And that's it. After that, Literally, I had them sit down after do their exercise, and it was silent. And I walked by, I go, that's what I mean. And for the rest of the hour, people were engaged. And nobody was upset. You, you've got to be able to control the room for the client experience. And if I'm delivering a message for an hour, it's got to be something that people can listen to. I love that story. What about increasing our self-awareness and identifying personal idiosyncrasies that I think we often assume are just the norm, but are actually the exception? We always say when it comes to leadership and especially influence, and by the way, when I talk about leadership and influence, they're synonymous. There is no leadership without influence right? and influence is the how of leadership. And so I'm, I use those two words very inter, I intersperse both of those two words. Mm-hmm. And so when we're talking about self-awareness and I've, I had, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of work in some of the world's largest, most well-trained organizations, well-funded for training. And I always go to their leadership training manuals and books and trainings. I always want to see what they're doing. And I started seeing a trend of the most well-trained organizations that their leadership training always began with self-awareness. And I remember the first time I saw that, I'm like, okay, that's self-awareness. I'm like, okay, that's really hokey. Like, and I'm like, I'm super self-aware. <laughs> and it's the, the more I dove into it, I started really realizing that the, the unaware leader, you can't help. If they're not aware of how they affect people, they're not aware of the impact that they have, the fact that everyone's watching them, the, they're a bull in a china shop. They're not realizing that the the jokes they make that at the wrong time have massive impact on their organization. A parent that doesn't realize that the child is paying attention, the teacher doesn't realize, or the coach doesn't realize that. So there's a there's an impact piece that we need to realize. And what works against self awareness is a lot, oftentimes humility. Mm. Ironically, is the, the a really good leader is sometimes very very humble, and a humble leader might believe. And well, who's going to watch me? I'm just just me. <laughs> well, everyone is watching you because you're the leader. And so there's there's a balance of humility that needs to happen where the you 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 can remain humble yet realize the impact and the role that you've been selected for. And so you it's I tell people leaders I said you don't have the luxury of being oblivious to your impact anymore. <laughs> Uh, you talk about framing uh, for for better reaction. Talk about some ways we can apply framing to direct answers for better audience reaction. So framing is the way we understand reality. Okay, so whether I frame my idea or not, there's going to be a frame created. It depends on if it's I'm going to be creating the frame, controlling the frame, or you are the listener. And what happens is 
you know, I, the example I give all the time, you know, if I were to tell you, uh, give me a word that comes to mind when I say this profession, used car salesman, what, give me a word that might come to mind for you. Sleaze. <laughs> And I, I used to be a used car salesman. Oh, you did? Okay, good. <clears throat> I love it. And so you've got sleazy, pushy, uh, disingenuous, <laughs> all these words that are very predictable. Yeah. Yeah. And so I go, okay, so what happened? All I said was a profession with no frame around it, with no context. And for us to understand the here and now, we have to go back to our past and, and assign a frame to it. And that frame, in essence, creates a narrative. So frames and narratives are very, very close. Mm. And that narrative begins to tell a story of what's happening in the here and now. And so I understand reality based on frames and narratives. It's a very powerful concept when we really get it. And so if I don't provide a narrative or a frame, most people will pull from their past experiences to create one so they understand. And so I'll, I'll say in a room of a thousand people, for used car salesman, sleazy, pushy, blah, blah, blah. Some people would be like hardworking, you know, that they worked in the industry or their parents were or whatever. Mm. They're all pulling from their frame of reference. And I said, so here it was, I just said a, a word and it triggered all of the stuff to, to create meaning. Mm. We're doing that every day with things. We're, we're using words and phrases. I could just say, hey, I want you to read a book and I could go back to my teacher that, you know, was so mean and belittled me because I didn't want to read a book and mm. books mean stress. Or I could mean books, you know, what saved my life because it gave me information. Who knows what your experience is, but they right. all trigger a narrative. And so the process of framing in, in the, the Amplify formula in the book is about understanding that I need to claim the frame. It's a claiming process. You know, whoever's going to claim it. And if I can claim the frame first, then I am more influencing the meaning of the message and the intent. So my grandfather was in Cuba and he saw the Cuban revolution was on its way. Mm. He knew this wasn't good for the family. So he decided to write a letter to the president of the United States at the time saying, if you can get me and my family out of this country, I'll, I'll come and fight for yours. So some of that letter made it to the right person. And they pulled my family out, my, my grandmother, my mother, and my aunt and my grandfather. And he went and served in the American Armed Forces for eight years. Mm. After that service, he finally landed in the American dream, Homestead, Florida. When I say American dream with quotes, because at the time, Homestead, Florida was pretty desolate. Mm. Patrick Air Force Base was basically the only thing there. So his quote unquote American dream was limited to how far he could walk. But there's somebody who believed in my grandfather, saw what he did for this country and got him into this older vehicle. And that older vehicle allowed him to extend his reach by 25, 50, even sometimes 100 miles to let him have better employment and make more money. Mm. That person basically changed the trajectory of my grandfather's life, my mother's life, and ultimately my life. And that person was a used car salesman. Mm. And so now that frame or that narrative illustrates a different story and keeps our eye on the ball of what the actual message is. It doesn't mean that, wow, they must be a great person. Man, they did good. But now the old frames don't get in the way of the message and the story or the meaning of what I'm trying to accomplish. Mm. I sold cars for about a year and a half, and and I only hope I had that kind of impact on on just one person. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> well, right now, used car salespeople are making a lot of impact with the with the uh, with uh, the shortage for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the power of sequencing, and 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 if you would unpack uh, what you call the the three P's as a part of this process. Yeah, it's kind of hinted towards it, and it, this was one of those things that sort of came up in in the process and working with people. But I, I tell people, I want you to write down three Ps, and and I function from these three Ps. And the first one is if I can predict a behavior, I meaning if I can predict a response based on something that's going to happen. Hey, we're about to announce a shutdown of a plant. Hey, we're we're about to announce that interest rates went up. Hey, you know the death of a, a coworker, you know, or. Um, hey, the, the, I've got bad news. If you can say, okay, well, what might be the predicted behavior? And the good news is if, if we put some intention behind that, that question, most people can come up with a pretty good assessment about what's happening. And so if I can predict a behavior, then I should engage in the second P, a preemptive strategy to try to prevent it. Mm. So if I can predict it, I should preempt it to prevent it. That's a good sales technique. If I can predict a, an objection, I should probably have a, something in play to bring that objection up to preempt it before it comes up and, and just inevitably uh, prevents it. It works in social media in short form video. We use a process called hook objection problem solution. If you watch any of my videos on uh, my learn with Renee at Instagram and TikTok, a hook, which would be a three second audition for your attention and then objection, which would be to cover the most likely objection that co comes up in your mind, which would be the preemptive strategy. And then we define the problem, claim the frame, right? Mm -hmm. Problem definition frame, and then offer the solution, which would be the third step is the tie down. And that little formula grew our TikTok to over 160,000 followers in two months. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's like almost getting approaching 10 million views in two months. And so 
it's no different than what advertising firms have done in the past or headlines, you know, newspaper, but reapplied in a different way. I mean, I can talk about this stuff all day. Neuroscience is a fascination of mine. And, and I, I just, I mean, first of all, you've got a great sounding voice. I get that compliment all the time. But then I hear people like you and I think that's what a really great sounding voice <laughs> is supposed to sound like. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned the forward and I agree. It's one, it's one of the best book forwards I think I've, I've ever read. There was this uh, mention of Aristotle uh, with regard to your work. How have you managed to effectively tie the persuasion models of Aristotle to your neuroscience research? You know, I, and I agree. I, uh, Dr. Al is, is amazing. And um, mm-hmm. the work that he's doing is is so fun. I mean, he's just such an amazing person, probably somebody worth having on your podcast. Mm. So Aristotle was the first person to talk about argumentative thought and persuasion 2000 years ago. And it's, you know, it, it'd be a crime not to at least look into what he was saying. And I think what he's saying in, has been a foundation for a lot of really big branding firms too. They, they t- talk about what his call, what's called his rhetorical triangle and psychologists call it the three motivational appeals of ethos, pathos, and logos. And mm. most people have heard those terms, but not many people go very deep into what they really mean. And ethos is, is to me my favorite of the three. It's, it's the, mo- the one that's hardest to understand. It's the, we, we, we define it as by your credibility and your character. It's also the essence of who you are. And I like to look at things that they're opposite to understand them. So the opposite of eth- having ethos would be me doing, you know, there's a workshop that I'm doing on the menstrual cycle and the challenges that women go through. Like, well, Renee, you probably shouldn't be the one training that <laughs> workshop because, uh, you know, yeah, I, I do that in sessions and the women look at me like, what are you why and i'm like oh you don't want to take like no you you know nothing about the menstrual cycle i'm like yeah i know nothing about it and you know i'm also bald so i was to say that you know we're going to do a workshop on how to grow rich and thick hair <laughs> and there's no ethos there there's no credibility it's not in my it's out of character for me to do something like that and it's the personal trainer telling you how to lose weight but they're out of shape it's the broke person telling you how to make money it's it's there's no ethos and so ethos is your credibility Right. Mm-hmm. And there are lots of ways to grow your credibility. You know, social media has some superficial ways of doing that. You know, the vanity metrics, number of followers. And we talked about podcast downloads. And those are sort of credibility points that are part of the equation, whether we want to see them or not. And and, and so the the other pieces are, you know, did you write a book? There's a big ethos play. And if it does if the book does well, it's a bigger, a bigger, you know, feather in the cap in terms of ethos. But ethos goes further. It's the essence of who you are. And I tell people, it's the most effortless thing that you can talk about. It's the most effortless thing that you're passionate about that, you know, you don't have to prepare for. People ask you about, you know, if I were to just ask you about reading, could you talk about that? Or do you need to prepare something? No, you could passionately talk about that for hours and hours and hours and hours because it's in your, it's your ethos. And so for me, that's the first part. And so like a doctor has ethos, but you know, doctor says, Hey, um, you, you need to lose weight and eat better. You say, okay, great doc. Thanks. I'll, I'll start next week. Why did you start now? Well, sometimes doctors lack pathos, which would be the second one, the, the emotional appeal. Mm. It's the passion behind something. It's what connects it to behavior and passion and emotion are what drive behavior. Gosh, I wish it was logic that drove behavior. It's just not. Mm. We're driven. We're passionate, emotional human beings. And pathos, if it's, you know, if there's a, you know, like my words might make sense, like are talking in a passionate uh, word choice. I'm excited to be here would be a passionate work choice, but delivery of pathos might be, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. And it's like, there's a, there's an incongruency of pathos. You know, I'm really excited to be here. You can hear it in my tone, you know, my inflection. And so there's a congruency that we look for in ethos and pathos. It's the person that's, you know, it's doing a, uh, uh, that has the content of how to show up and look really well put together, but it's got a wrinkled shirt and their tie is on backwards and there's a hole in their pants. It's like, well, okay. So the delivery really also matters or the person that, you know, has great content, but you know, is, is trembling on stage and ums and ahs the entire time, even though the content's great, it's just, um, a, um, you know, uh, confused and clouded by ums and these crutch words. So Ethos and pathos are in content and delivery, but the logos is the third one, the logical appeal. It has to make logical sense. There has to be a logical, a case for what's going on. I've got to be able to connect the dots. Once I, I'm, I'm enamored with who you are and you're the one to talk about this and the emotion is all in play, what's the plan? I don't know if I understand the plan and it's got to make logical sense. And so ethos, pathos, logos are his rhetorical triangle. There's a, there's a forgotten two. I call them the forgotten two because... I never heard or read about them until about 
three years ago. And it's a Kairos and Telos or Telos, depends on how you want to pronounce it. Kairos comes from the word chronology and comes from, you know, the timeliness of a message. And we're talking about, you know, you got to be credible in what you're talking about. You got to have some emotion and passion behind it. It's got to make logical sense, but it's also going to be timely. And it's, it's, it's the, you know, somebody that says, well, I'll have my secretary give you a call. What? That's a word from the seventies and eighties and not sooner. (laughs) <laughs> now you could use that, but be out of Kairos, out of tune with the timeliness of the message, mm. and you've lost your ethos and your credibility immediately. Not not staying up to t- in in up to date with what's happening in the languages that we're using and and the language sets. And you know, I made a mistake twenty years ago, almost uh, eighteen years ago. I was in a plane crash, and we had landed, lost hydraulics, crashed another plane, and I was telling the story from stage. And I said, well, it was crazy. I went flying into the bulkhead and then the, the, the stewardess came running up the aisle. Face was bleeding. And, you know, this whole thing, I had to calm her down. It's, I mean, it's a really traumatic story. And these two young ladies came up to me afterwards. They said, Renee, that was an incredible presentation. But you lost us at? Stewardess. <laughs> stewardess. Oh, my gosh. Such a rookie mistake. And at first I was like, that's all they got out of it. But then it was followed by, you know what? They're right. I am better than that. And Mm. I tell leaders, speakers all the time, we've lost the luxury to be lazy in our language choice, to be tone deaf. We don't have that luxury. If you're, if you want influence, you're going to be watched. Like Mm. it's crazy. I had somebody on, I mean, our TikTok, if you want some humor, follow my TikTok. (laughs) Somebody said, why is your nose partially purple? (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I, guess I, got, I didn't notice that, but it is kind of purple. Okay. Hold on a second. But you know, it's people are going to watch everything. So, yeah. and then telos would be literal translation. In Greek is end. It's the purpose of your talk. If you don't have good telos in your presentation, you will ramble because you've lost sight of the end message and purpose. Mm. The ethos, pathos, logos, kairos, telos, or the Aristotle's five. A lot of times when the topic of influence comes up in the context of in particular sales, people, I think, often conflate it with manipulation. I once had uh, the great copywriter Ray Edwards on the show. We talked about the difference between writing copy that influences and copy that that manipulates. How how, how do you set the two apart other than the obvious? Yeah. Well, to me, there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. Three major ones. One is manipulation is the use of persuasion and influence tools to an extreme, number one. Second, at the expense of someone else. And thirdly, usually done underhandedly and not visible or known to the listener. So there's this sense of an extreme use of something that is at the expense of one person, then it's done unbeknownst to the other. And so those things are where manipulation can sort of come into play. And people think are the same as influence. And no, influence is very, most often on top of the table saying, I'm a passionate. I want you to understand why I'm passionate about this. And yes, and I even tell you, I will use every tool to influence you right now because you need to hear me on this one. And I can say it with a smile, but it's also not an extreme use, but it's also to the benefit of the person. If somebody is, is doing drugs or if they're about to do make a stupid mistake in their business or their life, you should use every tool of persuasion you have to get them to stop. And anybody who says that they don't would lie to you about something else as well. We as humans use the tools at our disposal to try to design a life that's safe and productive around us. That's just, that's human nature. And influence is there. Women are fantastic influencers. Children are fantastic influencers. My wife's daughter tells me, nay, she is so smart. Three years old. We're all going to the store. And we have two boys with us and her. Mommy, can they take me to the girl section and you go to the boy section? She knows if she asks for something, who cannot say no to her? And she's like so sweet about it. And it was just like, and I'm just like, the answer is yes. What do you need, this sweet child? And we know at an early age, there are certain things that work. And as we get more sophisticated with it, we start learning in the concept of, you know, of course, ethically influencing people is should be inherent in that. You don't hear me say that's what Cialdini would always talk about, uh, ethical influence. But I think influence in and of itself is ethical. It should be. Manipulation is the extreme. It's possible that an answer you've given overlaps with the next question I'm going to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway, just in case. Tell me about your your love method, L-O-V-E, for helping us become better communicators. So I spent, I've spent a lot of years working with salespeople and leaders that need to learn how to just have conversations with people. And you'd be blown away by how often people don't know how to just have a conversation. They don't know how to keep a conversation going or being a conversationalist. And 
one of the things that we realized was that we really needed to teach people. And, 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 and there's a funny foundation of this too, where, you know, men that are approaching women that they're interested in, they completely change their tone, they, their voice changes, their approach changes, they become <laughs> awkward. And you take somebody who's very successful in business and you, he sees a girl that he likes and all of a sudden he just, he's inept in his communication style. And, or you take a salesperson that needs to go sell somebody and, and call on them. They're just the same process happens. And the common denominator there is that there's a hidden agenda. You know, people say, well, nice guys finish last. It's like, well, no, nice guys are passive manipulative liars. <laughs> what? Well, yeah, I, I tell this nice guy. He's like, well, my, you know, I said, well, why were you nice to her? And so, well, my mother taught me. He said, well, really? Well, if that's true, why weren't you nice to her, 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 and her? Why only her? Why extra nice to her? Mm. And he's like, well, I, you know, you like her, right? And he's like, yeah. I said, there's nothing wrong with liking her. I said, but women know that guys aren't just extra nice for no reason. There's a quid pro quo here. There's a, there's an underlying agenda. And the thing is, it's like, it's a passive manipulative move to say, if I'm nice, maybe I'll get more attention. And she's seen it her whole life, the same as our prospects in the sales process. You know, we, we can read it and smell it a mile away. So it's being overly nice. And if you've watched like the movie Breaking Bad, I think it was such a great job when Walter was, you know, he's clearly lying to his wife and he's making breakfast every day and everyone's looking at him like, what is going on here? And he's just, it's just a, like, it's clear as a window. You can see right through it. <laughs> and she finally says, you know, these desperate breakfasts of going on, you're not being honest. And, you know, so this passive manipulation in that sense of being nice. And so to me, the love method was how do you get people to change? And this is where Cialdini's influence comes into play too, is the underlying agenda is typically I want someone to like me. And if they don't, then I feel rejected, which is why I don't like cold calls, which is why I don't like approaching you know, the opposite sex. And there's a possibility of rejection. Well, the rejection exists only because you have a hidden agenda. If you remove the hidden agenda, there's nothing to reject. Hmm. So people say, well, how do I remove the hidden agenda? I said, stop trying to get people to like you. <laughs> and start proactively, start trying to like them. Wow. And that's where we implement and sort of we see the implementation of Cialdini's law of liking, one of the laws of influence. And we tend to like people who like us. And so if I approach somebody with curiosity and interest and true intrigue, and they're a jerk to me, I may find out quickly, I, there's not much to like about them. And that's okay. And then if I'm doing business and I've realized that they're kind of a jerk and I, I and you know, but if I had a hidden agenda, their same behavior would be now framed as resist or as, as rejection, but I am not offering anything. I'm actually just trying to find people that I be, that, that believe what I believe and that I enjoy doing, doing business with. And I don't really enjoy them much. So I can just say, Hey, you know what? I'm so sorry that I bothered you. I hope you have a fantastic day. And I walk away going, thank God, I don't have to do business there <laughs> or thank God I don't have to take them on a date because they were kind of mean. <laughs> and so there's a, a reshift on what's going on and it's more authentic. And people say, well, it's just, no, you're, it, if you, you can't dupe this system, by the way, you can't pretend that there's no agenda. Mm. You have to truly get yourself in the mindset. And mm. this is why we prepare a lot of people for this as well is to say, you have to truly believe that you shouldn't do business with everyone. And just because someone's pretty, you shouldn't want to date them. You know, just because someone's lucky in the gene pool doesn't mean they're entitled to dates. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's just not how it should work, but it's kind of how we're designed. So we have to fight against our own sort of natural uh, way of, of, of being. And it's the same in sales. It's the same in leadership. And so love method was, you know, we would, I'd go through and I'd go through a process of booking appointments and showing people a methodology for call, call calling. And then we started creating all these appointments using the methodology. And then people were like, well, what do I do when I get there? And by the way, everything I'm doing here is a frame to your question. <laughs> and sometimes frames take a little longer, but they're worth it. Right? Mm. So what do I do? I'm like, just have a conversation. And they'd look at me with a blank stare. I'm like, I'm like how? <laughs> and I realized that people have lost this art of conversation. So I had to go in and say, okay, well, what is it that I do? And I came up with three letters. They listen, they validate, and they expand. Mm -hmm. They listen with the intent of searching for something they like, and they validate it, and then they ask an expanding question. And about two years into it, somebody said, you know, you should add an O in there. And I'm like, what are you talking I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> listen, observe. Observe their behavior, because mm -hmm. that'll tell you a lot, whether it's an eye roll, where are their feet pointed, are they, you know, trying to walk out, are they looking at their watch? Is there a sense to observe their tone of voice too? And is there, is there a passion point? Does it kind of fall off dead? So listen, observe, validate, expand is the love process. And in practice, it's very powerful. And what people realize is about a minute into the practice, they forget that they're using a sequence because they're having such a rich conversation. Mm. 
Kind of reminds me, I don't remember who said it, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that explanation and that process and, and, and the idea of going in without an agenda and doing it sincerely is really powerful. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, Renee, uh, if we have a few minutes left that I want to ask you, uh, not directly related to the book. Before I do that, anything else from the book that I didn't ask about you want to make sure people walk away with? I think that one, I really appreciate your questions. I mean, it's the, the book is designed for anybody that is looking to influence and understand influence. It's not just for salespeople and leaders. I, I wrote it if a police officer picked it up or if a parent picked it up. I wrote it for students that are looking for job interviews. You know, people that are just want to understand the overall science of influence because influence is at the core of life. Mm. And so I, I guess I'll say this and you know, why influence? Imagine a life without influence. You walk in a room and no one pays attention. No one even takes notice. You tell a joke, no one laughs. You sell a product and no one buys. You cast a vision and no one follows. It's, it's, a, it's a really difficult existence. And I would say it's probably the worst of the human experiences. And so to me, the lack of influence is at the core of depression. It's at the core of anxiety. It's at the core of suicidal thoughts because we don't feel like we can impact this world around us. And we feel insignificant. Feeling invisible is a horrible feeling. And then the opposite of that, you walk in a room, people take notice. You tell a joke, people laugh. You sell a product, people buy. You cast a vision and people follow. That to me is at the height of human experience where I can impact the world. And I think that the more we can help people find impact and influence and, and significance, it's just inevitably the world's a better place. And so I think that's at the core of the reason behind the book. Love it. I'd love it if you could recommend maybe a couple uh, books that have impacted you. Maybe they're books you recommend to others often. You know, if you're in sales, there's a great book. because I think it has a great philosophy by Mahan Khalsa. It's called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. <laughs> and to me, it's, it really shows how to build a value proposition or how to build a business case for your idea. He's a, he's a Harvard guy. Um, he worked with the Covey Group for a while. But I tell people, listen to the audio and have the book as reference. But the audio, the way he explains it in the audio is so critical. And the, the book to me, I think, illustrates so many a philosophy in life. of like, If I can't get real with you, we can't have a real conversation. Why are we playing? Uh, I just don't want to play anymore because it's to me, I think that little concept applies to so many different pieces and it shows you how to get real in a business context of what it really means to ask the tough questions in a very respectable way. And it gives you a different approach to how to listen and truly help people succeed. And that's, that's the goal. And that's what he says. Everyone's goal is to help someone succeed. And if I can help you succeed, then there's a way to get, if I can't get real about that success journey, then we shouldn't be playing this game. Mm. Uh, Renee, in, in May, I began offering a live cohort called Note Making Mastery. Mm. And, and we dig into uh, this idea of personal knowledge management. And as someone who creates as much as you do, whether it's writing a book or preparing a talk or, or working with a client, um, I would imagine you've got to have some kind of systems in place on the notes you take on the content you consume and the things that you learn and want to remember, do something with and leverage, maybe that stories, what have you. Share, if you would, any part of your process for capturing or collecting the things you want to remember or how you organize them, how you distill them into your own thoughts and ideas, or how you ultimately create with them or all four of those things. <laughs> for sure. Well, I think that I think the one is you have to surrender to the idea that you won't remember the thought when it comes. That was one thing I had to just surrender. If it's a mm. middle of the night, I'm like, I'll remember in the morning. No, I won't. <laughs> right. If I'm in the shower, where I won't. And if I don't capture it and write it down, then it's a really big lost opportunity. And when you realize, and, and I got this inspiration from John Mayer, a musician, and he said, sometimes you have this moment of creativity. And if you have that moment of creativity, you just stop what you're doing and you lock in on it. You grab a pen and you write and you let your pen write. Whatever it is, just keep that hone, that moment don't judge a single thing that you're writing. Just get it out. You can always judge it later. Words, smith it later. Just let the words flow. In those rare moments that happens, you got to do it and use what we call omnipresent note-taking tools, whether it's a voice text tool, whether it's uh, Evernote, which is great. On my, my iPhone, they've really upgraded their note app. So, I mean, you can you know search everything on there. You can add everything. So the notes app is fantastic. Whatever you can do, to capture that moment, that thought, that idea, you know, your brain is fascinating and it's constantly figuring puzzles out. And when you set an intention to say, I really need to figure this out and you, you, you mess with it and you let it go. Sometimes you wake up and your brain has just sort of been hashing it over and in the back of its mind, back of your mind. So capture those moments in any way that you can. And, you know, organizing them to me 
contextually based and the most easily referenced. And for me, the question is when I need this, where will I look for it first? You put it there and that might be a CRM. It might be in the calendar for today. Like right now, they know to put those notes in the calendar invite because when would I need it? Well, when I'm actually meeting with you. So I just open up the calendar invite and it's contextually based. It's right there. Like I don't want to see my notes that I got to, you know, what I got to buy at Target when I'm sitting in Walmart. I only want to see that when I'm at Target. So, you know, there's a contextual basis to that and easily referenced. And with the tools we have available to us today, especially our phones, there's really no excuse for not being able to capture those those amazing ideas when they come. This has been a lot of fun, Renee. Thank you so much. The book, again, is Amplify Your Influence, Transform How You Communicate and Lead. It's available now. I highly recommend that you pick it up. You'll be glad you did. Renee, thank you so much for being a part of the Read to Lead podcast. I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. The honor was definitely mine. You know what I just did? I grabbed the audio book of Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. Based on that recommendation, I had a few credits I hadn't used yet. So, hey, why not? Looking forward to listening to that. Thank you, Renee. Hey, if you'd like to connect with Renee online or find out more about the resources and links shared today, it's all on the show notes page for this episode. Read to lead podcast.com slash 448 for episode 448. One reminder and one programming note, a reminder that the self-paced edition of Note Making Mastery is available right now at jeffbrown.me. If you struggle with your notes on the content you consume, if taking what you've learned and putting it into action is harder than it needs to be, Note Making Mastery is designed to solve that problem for you. Again, jeffbrown.me for more. And next week, we welcome back for the third time, Carmine Gallo will talk about his new book, The Bezos Blueprint. That wraps up this week. Hope to see you next time. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.